Palaroga Shark Media. Hello and welcome to Palace Intrigue. I am your host, Mark Francis. Robert Hardman's biography of King Charles suggests that Kate made a deliberate choice to stay with her and Prince William's children on the day Queen Elizabeth died. Royal commentator Kinsey Schofield outlined the contrasting accounts during a recent appearance on GB News. She explained, Catherine, the Princess of Wales, has chosen to stay behind to be with her children to see them off to school. This was a conscious decision that she made for her and her family. This conflicts with Harry's suggestion that she was told to stay back by King Charles to justify Meghan's lack of an invitation, which is what Harry says in spare. While Kate opted to care for her children, Meghan had already left hers in California before news of the Queen's passing reached the UK. On Monday, September 5th, just four days before the Queen's death on September 8th, Meghan addressed the One Young World Summit in Manchester. She encouraged young leaders to tackle health, social and environmental issues for a better future, although Schofield suggested she was there to collect a participation trophy. Schofield emphasised the distinction, stating, It's important to note that while Catherine stayed back to support her babies, Meghan was thousands of miles away from hers in the UK to accept another participation trophy. Kate's absence continues to be felt by the tabloids and podcasters alike. Poor Hello magazine had to go with Princess Anne debuts silky slip skirt in major style move. They also tell us, as for her hair, and swept her tresses up into a classic French twist up to. The princess added a slick of red lipstick and a simple gold necklace to complete her ensemble. Well, what about Meghan? Couldn't she have picked up the slack left by Kate's void? Royal writer Esther Krauk thinks not. She told Sky News Australia, The reality is she was not necessarily the best suited to life in the royal family, and I don't blame her for that. I don't think she was well prepared for the role she would undertake and by extension whether she would even have wanted to take that role. One of the advantages that Kate has was that she was with William for almost a decade before they got married and she assumed the roles she had. Harry effectively shoehorned Meghan into the institution. And it wasn't a matter of him marrying her and they were creating a life together. He married her with the intention of also having her as a working royal. He could have married her and stepped back, but he didn't. I suspect that Meghan didn't have the temperament to do it. I don't think she was well suited for the role. I don't think she would have been interested in playing second fiddle to the Waleses. I don't think she would have liked the regimented, strict lifestyle of a working royal. And I think she might have had her own intentions with the exposure and the platform she has had as a duchess being very handy and will always be handy. She will always get attention now. One of the things that was missing was duty. Did she ever show a sense of duty given the length of time she and Harry stayed as working royals and how they left acrimoniously everything that's followed? I think the answer is no. The Daily Beast suggests Kate's health crisis might reunite the Fab Four. A friend of Kate, William and Harry, but apparently not Meghan, told the Daily Beast, health problems do tend to put everything else in perspective. If Harry and Meghan have made an effort to reach out to Kate to offer their best wishes, Kate will reciprocate. William would quite happily never speak to either of them again, but Kate's a peacemaker at heart. She would definitely be open to using the situation to build bridges. Never waste a good crisis, right? You have to remember that Kate and Harry were exceptionally close. He adored her, and she provided a sense of stability after the chaos of his youth. I actually can't imagine a world in which he wouldn't have sent her a note, despite everything. Everyone in the family has, frankly, had enough of the whole feud narrative. It's way past time the whole thing was put to bed. Trust has been damaged, and I don't think they're ever going to be calling each other for a heart-to-heart -heart like the old days, but it's time to move on. A nice sentiment, but a friend previously told the Daily Beast that William absolutely effing hates Harry. Palace Intrigue will be right back. In light of this week's visit to Jamaica, Fox News reminds us that Meghan seems to really like the place. Fox writes, Markle has a small place in her heart for the tropical island. In 2011, she said, I do, to her first husband, Trevor Engelson, during a four-day destination wedding at the Jamaica Inn in Ochos Rios. Despite dating for nearly a decade, the former couple separated after two years of marriage and were granted a no-fault divorce in February 2014. Royal biographer Andrew Morton alleged that Markle ghosted him and sent her rings back by registered mail. Other reports said the two grew apart as the former actress rose to fame thanks to her role on Suits. 
In the Daily Mail, Robert Jobson writes, Court gossip has been part of royal life for centuries, but the online trolls who are attacking the Princess of Wales as she recuperates in hospital from major abdominal surgery have taken things to a new level. I won't dignify their bile by repeating it here, but suffice to say, it is so appallingly offensive, it is hard to see how anybody could possibly consider such behaviour in any way acceptable. They have even turned on Sarah Ferguson, albeit not so viciously, following the revelation that she has skin cancer. It beggars belief that these laptop warriors, who are invariably cowards who hide behind pseudonyms, are allowed to get away with spewing such hatred. Trolling royals is, of course, nothing new. As far back as the 16th century, Queen Elizabeth I's love life was the subject of agitated gossip, never more so than following the Countess of Essex's secret marriage to the Earl of Leicester. Better known as Lettuce Nollies and Robert Dudley, respectively, the latter had long been a favourite of the Queen and she was reported to be furious at her kinswoman's betrayal. The late 18th century saw the rise of printed gossip sheets in London, which were widely used by wronged lovers to air their grievances in public. The Duke of Cumberland, Henry Frederick, for example, suffered a very public humiliation for betraying a sex worker called Polly Jones, who subsequently shared her story with the press. Early in her reign, Queen Victoria was mocked and called Mrs. Melbourne because she was said to be too close to her first Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne, who she affectionately called Lord M. And in 1821, the gossip mongers had a field day when Caroline, wife of George IV, caused a scene at her husband's coronation, attempting to enter despite being banned. And there you have it. If you'd like to email us, our address is thepalaceintrigue at gmail.com. Please follow us on Spotify, Apple, or your app of choice. And if you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. It really helps. I'm Mark Francis. My thanks to John McDermott. This is Palace Intrigue. Good times. <laughs>